Hi everyone and welcome to the Eating for Fat Loss webinar presentation. I'm Mark uh, and thanks for joining us and for joining the program. So hopefully you'll find this interesting today and you'll get something out of it and some ideas about how you can manage your weight uh, or even just healthy eating in future. So without further ado, let's get started. So what will I show you today? So just in case you don't quite know me, I'll show you who I am and why you should listen to me, the history of diet and how it has evolved over time, the main dietary factors in gaining and losing weight, and then what you can do to keep the weight off, and then how you can get involved, although chances are if you're watching this you're already on the program so you're already involved, but perhaps how you can bring others into the loop or spread the word. So there I am, so why should you listen to me? So my first passion was sport and exercise science, and this degree really taught me how to think about training and exercise for both athletes and general health by looking at the anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, and biomechanics of the human body. We then learned how to manipulate these bodily factors to elicit training responses and to really think laterally about getting the best results out of your training program. So the course also included nutrition modules, which is where my interest down this line of work was really initiated. So then I gained my personal training qualifications in 2010, and although I didn't really have to do this from a qualifications perspective, because I already had the sport and exercise science degree, uh, I wanted to because I figured anything new I can learn only benefits me and thus my clients in the long term. And it's also a great opportunity to speak and interact with like-minded people and professionals and bounce ideas off one another. <clears throat> then in 2014, I become an accredited dietitian. So having originally studied the basics of nutrition in both my previous degree and my personal training course, I subsequently become aware of the, pres the profession of dietetics. And having put it off for a few years, I decided to bite the bullet and return to university because I love a degree and complete the degree in nutrition and dietetics. And I'm often asked what the difference between a dietitian and a nutritionist is. And the difference is to register as a dietitian, you must meet or hold a minimum of a degree in nutrition and dietetics. That's the minimum standard. And you must be able to demonstrate all the preset competencies to practice in a safe and effective manner. So a dietitian usually works in a clinical setting. So that will be with patients in the NHS who have a number of nutritional issues. And this is why they must be able to practice in a safe manner. manner. A nutritionist, on the other hand, may very well have a PhD in nutrition and be very knowledgeable and qualified. But on the other hand, they may have no formal nutrition training at all. So dietitian is a protected term. You need to have studied a degree in it to have the qualification, whereas a nutritionist can be anybody. So the quality of information that they provide can vary massively. So always just take what a nutritionist tells you with a pinch of salt and make sure that you ask about their qualifications. And then finally, I've worked as a weight management dietitian since 2014 and recently branched out into bariatric surgery. So that's the primary patients I see in the NHS, but I also run my private business, which is Mark Green Nutrition, as you know, and I've been advising people from both a nutritional perspective and a personal training perspective for many years now and have over 10 years of experience in the industry. So what do I do and how can I actually help? So I work with clients specifically interested in fat loss but also people that want to get fitter and just generally improve their lifestyle and I make sure that I use a client and patient centered approach to make individuals lifestyle changes work for them in the context of their own life so there's no dictatorships of what I do. I work in a variety of ways both online and in person and I'm monitored by the Health and Care Professions Council so I'm accountable for the advice I give and so you know that I have my clients best interests at heart. Now let's get started. So there are literally thousands of different diets out there and everyone seems to have an opinion about what the best foods are to eat. The media are constantly publishing the latest dietary advice which will help you melt away the pounds and it is literally a minefield out there. So think about some diets you've tried in the past. Were they successful? They probably were for a time being. Of course they were. You were actually dieting. But considering you're watching this presentation or you're on the program or you've told me that weight loss is your primary goal, I imagine it wasn't sustainable. So how do you keep the weight off and build it into a sustainable lifestyle? 
how do you know what advice is correct? And as I mentioned previously, the whole point of my service is for me to teach you to become the expert. So that's our lifestyle transformation service. You will know for the rest of your life how to lose the weight, how to improve your diet, how to eat healthier, how to improve your lifestyle. And this is, in my opinion, the only way a sustainable change can be made rather than relying on some preset system. So if you ever receive a pre-written nutrition plan from a personal trainer, they haven't actually taught you anything. So once you get bored of their program or paying them for God knows what an hour, you revert back to the previous behaviours that you've had because you haven't learned any skills. So when you join a slimming club, you buy into their system and they tell you the food you can and cannot eat. And that's very helpful. And I am a reasonable fan of actually some slimming groups. But once again, they spoon feed you the information so you don't actually learn anything. It's all based on their point system. So you're tied into their system. So if you were to leave, you are reliant upon them. And I guess in a way, that's a great money making system. And then you also have like restrictive diets such as low carb, high protein, fasting, etc. And all these diets result in restriction in some form or another. Once again, of course, you lose weight when you're on them. But then you get to the six month period to the year period and evidence shows quite clearly that most people have put the weight back on and perhaps even more. And why? Because they are unsustainable for most people. And therefore, once you get bored of restricting yourself, you have not developed the necessary skills to manage your own weight. Instead, you have been following a plan on autopilot. So let's find out how to sustainably manage your weight or lifestyle change. So just following on from the previous point, yes, it is confusing out there, but some of the diets out available uh, do border on the absolute unimaginable. Yet people buy into them and then explain that it really worked. Of course it worked for you or for them, you were dieting. If I told you to stop eating for two weeks, eat whatever you want for one week and then repeat, you would lose weight. I know this is an extreme example, but it's to highlight that it's important to realize that some of these diets are actually what they are actually telling you to do. Sometimes you just need to take a step back and think, hang on a minute. Actually, this diet is telling me to just to reduce my carbohydrates, which in turn will help me limit my intake, which will lead to weight loss. So don't be suckered in to these <laughs> revolutionary new systems. Be smart with this and don't just focus on the end result, which is weight loss. Focus on the journey too, because ultimately the journey is how you're going to keep the weight off. So if you see the new all new air diet, don't just buy into it. Think about it. What is it that they're actually doing with the diet that's making me lose weight? So let's get into it. So if we're looking at where we're going with our diet, I think it's important to see where we've been. Therefore, I'm going to take a small amount of time to tell you about the history of the human race's diet and what's changed to elicit the current obesity epidemic we find ourselves in. So let's take a trip back through time and take a look at the evolution of diet. And the story begins some four to six million years ago. Our primate ancestors lived in the woods of Eastern Africa, so Tanzania, Kenya, Ethiopia, and their diet primarily consisted of leaves, roots, fruits, nuts, things like that at the time, which meant the main macronutrient we consumed was carbohydrate. Then approximately two million years back, the climate changed in Eastern Africa, where it became drier and colder, which made had a major impact on our habitat. So forests, which had previously occupied the land, disappeared and were replaced by bare grasslands inhibited by large herbivore predators like that one and these ecological changes provide an excellent opportunity for our ancestors to exploit animal resources so archaeological evidence strongly suggests that we ultimately moved to these grasslands and coastlines attracted by a much higher quality of food this meant from then on proteins and unsaturated fatty acids from game and fish were much more abundant in our diet, comprising some 50 to 60% of our total energy intake. This dietary change in turn allowed a crucial event in our evolutionary history to occur, the growth of our brain. There are at least two reasons why this particular change of food habits was essential for our brain to be able to grow. First, unsaturated fatty acids are essential building blocks of neural tissue, which is what we find in the brain. Approximately 50 to 60% of the human adult brain is made up of lipids, fats, which is unsaturated fatty acids. And second, our brain is extremely expensive in terms of energy cost. It consumes over 20% of total resting energy expenditure, despite being relatively small for the whole of our bodies. 
Therefore, the energy yield from far more nutrient-dense fish and meat is much higher from structural plant sources. So, this was quite a big deal. Eventually, our ancestors expanded out from Africa and began populating the world as it is today. People accidentally passed by the fertile grounds of modern-day countries such as Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, Israel, Iran and Turkey. And the climate characteristics of this region enabled our ancestors to begin developing crops such as cereals, legumes and flax, and four of the five most important domesticated animals, cows, goats, sheep and pigs. And because of these favourable environmental conditions, this area, known as the so-called Fertile Crescent, became the birthplace of modern agriculture and stock breeding some 10,000 years ago. So this was the birth of agriculture. The beginning of agriculture profoundly affected the composition of our diet. So hunter-gatherers thrived on a mix of carbohydrates, proteins and unsaturated fatty acids for millions of years. Yet it is important to note that there has been and there has not been one universal diet consumed by all hunter-gatherer communities, so there's been a range. Rather, it's suggested that by many studies that a typical hunter-gatherer tribes and using common sense, the availability of food depended on the geographic location and climate conditions. Therefore, humans evolved as variable omnivores, um, although it does seem likely that over 50% of hunter-gatherer diets comp comprised of animal food. However, various types of food cannot have been consumed on a regular basis before the birth of agriculture. Agriculture, in essence, reintroduced carbohydrate as the principal macronutrient. And to add to that, animal farming introduced dairy and promotes the consumption of saturated instead of unsaturated fat. The latter is for two reasons. First, cattle meat partially replaced fish in our diet, and fish is an important source of unsaturated fatty acids, our good fats. And second, the dominant fatty acid in the fat stores of wild animals are saturated, whereas muscle and other tissues prim primarily contain polyunsaturated or monounsaturated mono fats, the good fats. So because subcutaneous or deep and abdominal fat stores are depleted during the year in wild animals, Polyunsaturated fatty acids and monounsaturated fatty acids make up most of the total carcass fat. The birth of animal domestication and stock breeding prevented the seasonal depletion of saturated fat stores by year-round feeding. Therefore, cattle contain much more saturated fat when domesticated than when in the wild. Also, it became feasible to slaughter animals at peak body fat percentage. And therefore, the quality of the food has perhaps become less. So... Why am I telling you this? Let's take a look at a very quick quote. It is of primary importance for the prevention and treatment of any disease to understand its root cause. Although hominid artifacts supposedly depicting obese humans date back as far as 500,000 years ago, epidemic has evolved over the last 100. So, Regardless of whether we have eaten game, animal, fish, grazed the lands or mastered agriculture, in terms of obesity as an epidemic, it has not been a major health crisis until the last century. In fact, you could argue it could be more accurate to say over the last 30 years. And so somewhere, the scales of balance have tipped towards an obesogenic environment, and by that I mean an environment that creates or promotes obesity. So the question is, why? So what's changed? To get a good idea of why we're getting different results from our diet compared to our historical ancestors, it's always a good idea to identify what has changed. So, food production method. The invention of hydrogenation leading to trans fats. Mass production and bulk buying. Change in agriculture methods. Ability to eat food all year round. Sweeteners. Reduction in physical activity levels. Fizzy pop and calorific drinks. Ready available food 24-7 and convenience foods. So this is just to name a few, but it goes to show that things have changed. They say if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, for a thousand of years, the human race did not suffer from an obesity epidemic, yet in the last century it has exploded onto the scene, which is conveniently tied in with changes that our societies have made with regards to how we eat. 
So often it's debated in the press amongst health professionals and others what is the cause of the epidemic we face. Yet it's rare to see anyone look at the whole picture and think maybe, just maybe, all these little things have accumulated to make one big difference, with the result being mass weight gain amongst our population, rather than just it's sugar, it's fat, or just one dimension. So how to combat the weight? Should we call you a personal Everest? So to combat your weight gain, you first need to understand exactly why it is you're putting on weight in the first place. And we've discussed changes made to food supply, which have contributed at a national level, but sometimes it's difficult to see how this filters down to you as an individual. In my practice, it's difficult. It's my job to help clients identify what is contributing to their weight gain at an individual level and how they can prevent this with simple methods, which when performed correctly, doesn't really feel like a diet at all. So it takes certain skills to be able to take control of your weight once and for all, but these skills are very learnable and once you've learned them, they're easily committed to memory forever. So here are some factors I examine with clients. So carbohydrate and metabolism, the type of fats, snacking, awareness of the food you eat, and convenience foods. And we'll be touching upon these over the course of the seminars. So just to give you a brief overview, let's look at carbohydrates and metabolism. So carbohydrates are sugars. They come in various forms, but are typically classified as simple sugars or starchy, which you may be familiar with. So we have two, simple and starchy. Once eaten, the body breaks these down mainly into a sugar known as glucose. So all carbohydrates are broken down into glucose, but what differs is the speed in which they're broken down which is influenced by the amount of nutrients and fiber in the carbohydrate and how complex the molecule is. So starchy carbohydrates are also called complex carbohydrates because they're a more complex molecule. To give you an idea, table sugar isn't very complex and therefore it's absorbed very quickly. Whereas a starchy complex sweet potato is, uh, takes a lot extra time to actually break down for the, the body to break down. So it actually takes more digestion, which means it's absorbed more slowly. <coughs> All foods elicit a bodily response when we eat, so during digestion, absorption and storage, what are known as hormones, coordinate this bodily response. So hormones are simply messengers, as in they send messages to parts of the body for an action to be carried out. When we eat carbohydrates, a particular hormonal messenger system is initiated, which can play a big part in weight gain. The hormone insulin is released when we eat carbohydrates. So remember, insulin being a hormone carries a message, and insulin's message tells the body cells to allow carbohydrate and fat to enter them. Therefore, one action of insulin is it allows carbohydrate and fat to be used up as it enters the muscle cells. However, the other more prominent feature of insulin's message is for the body to store carbohydrate and fat. The tricky thing about insulin is it is directly matched to the amount of carbohydrate entering the system. Let's take a look at this graph. So when I say refined carbohydrate, I mean processed and high sugar foods, so sugar, or simple carbohydrates. It may surprise you that foods such as white bread produce a similar blood sugar response as pure glucose or sugar, because they're highly manufactured, a lot of the nutrition is lost. Therefore, it gives you some idea how manufacturing can influence a product. So this graph outlines the insulin response of two different carbohydrates. One of a refined carbohydrate, let's say a chocolate bar, and the other is a high fiber food, let's say granary or seeded slice of bread, although you can see the lines differ. The refined carbohydrate insulin response spikes really high before crashing back down, whereas the high fiber, more nutritious food demonstrates a more slowed and maintained rise. This is because the refined carbohydrate does not make, take much time for the body to absorb it. This means the body gets a big rush of sugar in a short space of time, which consequently results in a match insulin response. This is followed by a big crash because all the sugar is quickly absorbed and stored. The high fiber food, on the other hand, is gradually absorbed and therefore produces a more gradual rise in insulin. And this is important for two reasons. The rise and crash of insulin produces feelings of cravings because as far as the body is concerned, it is once again low in circulating glucose and therefore thinks it's lacking energy. This can make you feel hungry, irritable, grouchy, sluggish. And two, the quick rise in insulin means the circulating carbohydrate and fat which would have been used as energy without insulin, without, sorry, without the insulin response, is now quickly stored. So instead of being used up, it's now stored. With a quick storage effect, you don't have a chance to use it up 
um, or use up the energy you've just eaten. So compare this with a healthier alternative, the food is more gradually stored. This means less fat and carbohydrate in the circulation is stored, you feel fuller for longer and you do not get cravings and also you have a chance to use up the energy before it's all stored. Another point to add is also the more fibrous healthier options is also likely to be lower in calories than the refined carbohydrate. And that is why sugar and refined carbohydrates or simple carbohydrates can cause weight gain. <clears throat> This side sums up, sums up the fact that there are good fats which our bodies need. They cannot make them themselves and therefore must be attained through the diet. And there are bad fats which are typically processed as seen in pizzas, cakes, crisps, chocolate, etc. All fat has the same calories, so they're all 9 calories per gram. But the good fats have function in the body and are much better for health than the trans fats or the saturated fats as seen in the example of the bottle of the page. Therefore, aim to eat foods as seen as the top of row as opposed to the bottom row. So things like salmon, oily fish, avocados, nuts, seeds, peanut butter to an extent, but that is very high calorie. So take that with a pinch of salt, excuse the pun. But we'll touch upon this more when we discuss fats in detail in its own presentation. Now let's take a look at the awareness of foods. So one of the main problems I encounter when it comes to weight are the following problems. Snacks, quality, not just quantity, alcohol, cakes, biscuits, crisps, chocolates, so things like that, convenience foods, just to name a few. So let's start with snacking. Snacking can cause weight gain if the incorrect snacks are chosen. If already close to your daily requirement in terms of calories that you need through your meals, you have a smaller margin of area when it comes to your snacks. So low calorie and healthy snacks such as small to medium portions of fruit, crisp breads, chopped vegetables or yogurts are probably best. But remember, even fruit is food. So if you're overeating with anything, then it will cause problems. Although likely, if you're overeating by having a portion of fruit, it's probably actually in the main meals where the problem lies. But don't think of any food as a free pass. Yes, it's good to eat fruit, for example, for a healthy diet. But if you finish off a big lunch of 600 calories and then eat two pieces of fruit, you're eating excessively. You probably don't need the fruit as well, or you could reduce the portion of the lunch. The idea is to make sure that you're keeping an eye on the portions of the main meals and then just thinking proactively about the snacks that you take because they will add up. The second point refers to fatty meats. I put this in because a lot of clients I speak with say they eat foods like bacon, sausages, pork belly, lamb, etc. But they grill them or add no oil. And these foods are high in fat and calories regardless of how you cook them. It's good that they're thinking about how they can save extra calories, but they cannot understand why their weight isn't dropping. It is because, despite making better choices about cooking methods, they are simply eating unhealthy food or unhealthy foods too regularly. In other words, the quantity of food may be correct, but the quality is lacking. Foods such as poultry, uh, fish, pulses, lentils, nuts are far better choices compared to grilled portions of sausages or bacon, for example. Alcohol is always an important one, as I say. Thing, as I always say, um, think of each alcoholic drink as the equivalent of eating a chocolate bar. It's empty calories and prevents you burning up your already stored carbohydrate and fat stores. Therefore, alcohol is a big factor in why clients do not lose weight. So, if you're partial to a drink, maybe that's the reason. Cakes, biscuits, crisps, or chocolate, you don't need me to tell you that these are no good for you if you're trying to lose weight. The problem is people know this and yet still consume them. And it's because the body likes them and tells you it wants them. The best way to avoid them varies from individual to individual. However, strategies such as self-monitoring, writing down your intake or tracking your intake using an app such as the one uh, many of my clients use, which is MyFitnessPal. Also setting specific days that are no snack days or are a snack day, so you're planning in advance. Not buying the foods in the first place and avoiding situations where you are likely to indulge are prime examples of excess, successful strategies I've seen in the past. And finally, convenience foods. These are often high in fat or sugar to maintain the flavour. So they are full of ingredients to increase shelf life and therefore rarely fresh and are a major reason for weight gain. Simply by being more proactive and planning your meals for the week, even if that means freezing certain meals cooked in bulk, you're giving yourself a much better chance of not reaching for the convenience food. So here's the point I want you to take from this slide. 
Do not think about each point as an individual item. Think of them as one whole category. When performing dietary recalls with clients, I will ask them about their intake of each of these foods individually. Often I get replies like this. I only have one snack a day. I'll have a sausage maybe once a week and a bacon sandwich at the weekend. Perhaps two pints on a Friday and a Saturday night. And I only eat chocolate once per week. Oh, I only have crisps once per week too and I'll have the occasional biscuit or cake. So to them, looking at each of these individually, they aren't having any of these items regularly. However, when grouped together, the total goes from once per week individually to over one per day every day. So this adds up and in my opinion is one of the biggest reasons to why people can't lose weight and can't make dietary changes. So this is an example I use with clients to illustrate this point. So I'm just going to explain the diagram here. So the blue line in the middle, that represents the amount of calories you need per day for weight maintenance. On the right there, you've got the weigh-in when they'd come see me. And on the left here, you have the weights that they could have. So plus 10 kilograms, plus 5 kilograms, minus 5, minus 10 kilograms. And you're going to be seeing some dots in a moment. The blue dot, as you can see by the key on the top right here, is the effect on weight. And the red dot is a high calorie behavior. So someone starts their nutrition program or they start their lifestyle change and they're eating below the amount of calories they need. So as they go, this has an effect on weight, which actually brings them towards the minus. So they're going quite steadily towards minus five kilograms. But then they have a big blight at the weekend. Let's say they go out on a night out. And as you can see, the red dot in terms of calories is a lot higher above the line than what the blue dots are below the line, despite them being more of them. So the average effect on weight is this. And then they get back to it, and then they drop below the line once again, but oh, they have another high calorie behavior. And round and round we go throughout the weeks until we come to the weigh-in, and lo and behold, they're the same weight, and they can't understand why they haven't lost weight, because most of the time they've done well. But it's a lot harder to achieve a calorie deficit, as in eat less than what you need, because generally just in the three meals you'd have in a day will get you probably 80% of the way to your calorie requirement eating healthily. So any deviation from that, especially if it's a high calorie binge, such as a night out or a big meal, or you do a few nights in a week where you're having meals out or something or unhealthy options, it's going to have an impact on your weight. And it's not to say that you can't have um relaxed meals or you can't have a night out but if your weight isn't changing and you are prone to having these types of behaviors then that's more most likely the reason why it's happening now let's say that you did actually achieve minus 10 kilograms or so and this is where it gets rather complicated because if you do achieve a weight loss this line actually shifts so when this line actually shifts, it's because the person now weighs less. So there's less of them to maintain. So as we lose weight, we need less calories per day. And as we gain weight, we need more calories per day. And if we stay the same, we need the same amount of calories. There's physically more or less of us to maintain. And therefore, if you're having um, progress with your diet, or seeing progress with your diet, but then you hit a plateau, it's because you physically need less calories. So your dietary plan that you were putting into practice is no longer effective. And that might be great if you've reached the maintenance phase. But if you still have more weight to lose, then you need to reevaluate with your nutritionist or your trainer and then come up with a new plan or how you can tweak further to elicit further results. And as I say, that's weight maintenance there now. So you can see how it's shifted down. So what are the five top tips for good health? So I would say reduce the refined or simple carbohydrates and sugar intake. Um, and I mean, you can play this many different ways and it's whatever works for you really. Some people say no more than two treats per week. Some will go for a lower calorie option. Uh, it's really more of an individualistic thing. And so you're going to have to work with your trainer or your nutritionist to come to that conclusion. Reduce your intake of the bad fats, so choose lower fat meats, don't eat convenience food, avoid cakes, biscuits, treats, fast food. Make sure you're watching the portion sizes. This is something I really work on with clients because it can really undo your plan. 
and is a whole topic in itself and you will gain access to that in a further presentation. Reduce your alcohol intake. Remember, each alcoholic drink is like having a chocolate bar, plus the alcohol is really bad for health. Exercise daily, and by that I mean physical activity or exercise. So half an hour a day is all you need for, to improve health. If you're looking at weight loss or weight maintenance, 60 to 90 minutes, or you can do intense training for 45. So that will tie in with the activities that you're doing on the Fit Club program. Um, so just maintain that, and if you're having doubts or having problems, speak with your trainer. So that's it, guys. So thanks very much for listening to me go on, and I hope it's been very useful for you. Thank you for listening. Um, and if you have any friends that you want to bring along, remember that I offer a free consultation, and so it would be great if anyone wants to get in touch. And you've probably found me before as you're on the program, but... You, there's my website that can be found there drop me an email at markgreennutrition at gmail.com if you have any questions as you know I run Fit Club Southampton I offer fitness and diet coaching as well and an online dietitian service I offer consultations over Skype and as I mentioned about the free consultation so if you know anyone that wants to get in touch please do and if you haven't done so already find me on Facebook find the page because I often put updates on there or subscribe to our newsletter on the website NT details because that will give you more information about diet tips, nutrition tips, recipes, and also any information about Mark Green Nutrition. So I appreciate it, guys, and I'll see you soon.